So bear with me for a moment of Old Testament history. Some of you, uh, this may be rehearsing things you know very well already. But on the Holy Mount in Jerusalem, there is the site that for the better part of a millennium, uh, in fact over a millennium in total, was occupied by a temple that at one point was the largest and grandest building in the known world. It was first built on the watch of King Solomon uh, over a thousand years before the time of Christ. And then according to biblical tradition, it survived for several centuries under the watch of a series of kings. Uh, the kingdom of Israel split into two, a generation after Solomon. The so-called ten lost tribes of the north under one king, and then the tribe of Judah uh, centered in Jerusalem under another. But the temple continued operation and it continued to be the center of spiritual life until the early part of the 6th century BC when it was destroyed in the invasion of the king of Babylon. And the king of Babylon carried all of the poorest of Jerusalem and the surrounding country off to Babylon where they remained in exile for 70 years. And then they returned and in the later part of the 6th century BC, the temple was rebuilt. And even though the kingdom was never restored to Israel, it always remained a vassal of other empires, it stood there for several more centuries until in 70 AD, um, shortly after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, it was destroyed in the Roman siege of Jerusalem and in the war of the Jews versus the Roman Empire that happened at that time. Now I tell you all of this because if you go there, and I have not yet been blessed with that opportunity, but I, I pray to have it at some point, and I, I pray everybody who wishes to have it can have it at some point, um, there is one thing that remains of that temple, and it is the so-called Western or Wailing Wall. It is exactly what it sounds like. It was the Western Wall of the Temple Compound, and it's the one thing that wasn't just raised to the ground during the Roman invasion. And it's considered by both Jews and Christians alike to be a very holy site for prayer. <coughs> so not too long ago, this is a true story, uh, a reporter for a major news network wanted to do an expose on this place and on the faithful who went there. And he found an Orthodox Jewish man who uh, at this point I think was well into his 80s or 90s and had been going there to pray faithfully every day for at least seven days. And so the reporter asked this man several questions, but at one point he said, what does it feel like, especially given all that Israel has been through over these last several decades, what does it feel like going to this site to pray every day? And the man gave him kind of a wistful smile and said, I don't like talking to a brick wall. <laughs> it's kind of like talking to a brick wall. Now, doubters and atheists may have thought this was a dismissive or tongue-in-cheek comment. It wasn't at all. This was actually something built deeply into Orthodox theology. It's a deeply biblical understanding of prayer, and it's very much congruent with what we see in the Bible and supplementary texts. As those of you who were here last week or who noticed the emails noticed, we're having a sermon series right now on the topic of what is faith. And last week we spent some time discussing what faith is not. Today we're going to begin moving into what faith is. It's a little bit sometimes like talking to a brick wall. But let me say that a bit more positively. Today we heard the parable of the unjust judge and the widow who comes over and over and over again saying, grant me justice against my opponent. And eventually the unjust judge relents. And the message is faith is persistent in prayer. Persisting in hope, persisting in belief, even during the seasons when there seems to be absolutely no evidence to back any of it up. It's talking to that brick wall over and over, trusting that the brick is actually alive and listening. Now, why would we need to do that? Because at first glance, it looks 
looks like that is a, a cruel and uncaring God who just listens to us over and over again and says, yeah, yeah, I hear you saying, grant me justice, grant me justice, later, later, later. But I think something's going on there beneath the surface. Let's look at a couple of examples. In the last days of World War II, Christmas Eve of 1944, in the journal of an American soldier, this story was discovered. And keep in mind, this was the height of one of the ugliest battles of the entire war. The invasion of Normandy had gotten its beach hold. The Allied troops were working their way through Western and Central Europe, and Germany was making one last ditch effort to repel them in one of the bloodiest and ugliest conflicts that humanity has seen. And it's in this context that in the bunkers, the soldiers were having to celebrate Christmas. And at midnight on Christmas Eve, the American soldiers began to sing Silent Night in English. And then they heard the strangest thing. Coming from the enemy bunker, no more than yards away, the same hymn was being sung in German. On one side, people were singing hymns honoring the birth of Christ. On the other side, people were singing hymns honoring the birth of Christ. Both sides were crying out to God, God, grant me justice against my opponent. And both sides' prayer was, don't answer the other side's prayer because that means my destruction. Problem. Now fast forward to today. If you've been paying attention to the week's news, you know that Congressman Elijah Cummings of Maryland died suddenly and unexpectedly this past week. And the reactions to this have been extraordinary. There have been people who claim Jesus as Lord saying, thank goodness God finally answered our prayer. God finally gave us justice and derailed this completely absurd agenda. And yet there are people who claim Jesus as Lord saying, what a wonderful God-fearing man we have lost. What a champion of justice and of the gospel. And now he's gone. Both groups claiming Christ as Lord saying precisely the opposite thing is what it looks like for God to grant justice. What do we do with that? What we do with that is persist in praying to the brick wall. Friends, we overestimate ourselves if we think that our conscious definition of what justice and righteousness are is the objectively correct one. All of us have areas where we are creating God in our image, not the other way around. All of us have areas where things need to be corrected, set right. Our view of justice and righteousness needs to be turned or broadened in some way. There's not a single exception to that. So if God were to simply say, okay, I heard your prayer and I'm going to grant it exactly as stated. Wow, I don't think I want to live in that world. Stop and think about it for a minute. And I certainly don't want to live in the world where God's saying that to other people. Because I'm pretty sure I know what a few people might be praying about me and my community. So, what is the only way to make this work? The only way to make this work is to have a God who absolutely, deeply cares, who listens with a fatherly, attentive ear to every prayer that is thought and spoken, and patiently waits as we, with our warring human tendencies, cry out for a justice that often means the destruction of the other and waits until somehow we begin to rise above that. And it's only then, when our cry, God grant me justice against my opponent, when we realize that that opponent is not the other element of creation, but its powers and principalities 
that distort 